And I heard a voice actually above my head saying, there he is. It was like a kind of clear audience experience. It's a kind of experience I don't have very often, but I have had a few times in my life. Mm. And I was like, what? There who is? <laughs> like, <laughs> and then I just found myself singing with him. And it was, a, it was a really unique experience because I didn't know the song. And although the song is fairly repetitive, it was like the, the melody was being revealed to me before I'd even heard it. Hello, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madia Sosen podcast. Today we have a very, very special guest with us and they are called Sri Nari. Now, who are Sh Sri Nari? Sri Nari are a dynamic duo comprised of Lucidia Omamori and Rafael Machente. They are a leading duo in the spiritual music scene in the UK and the tour internationally playing at events such as alternative festivals, meditation, sound healing and yoga retreats. The heart and soul of Sri Nari's vision is to uplift the world through authentic expression, to be daring in their creativity, honest in their communication and courageous in their performances. So without further ado, let's bring them on. Hi guys, how are you doing? Hi. Yeah, really good. Very good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. I mean, it's, um, um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, we met uh, last year, didn't we, um, at our friend's uh, Conscious Dinner Club. Um, yeah. That was the first time you met, and then... Um, and then we didn't really we we didn't really connect until uh, the lockdown actually. Um, yeah. yeah, you were you guys were doing your first ever Facebook Live uh, concert, and I was like, yes, I know them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So um, tell us a bit about yourself. Like, um, how did you guys meet, and um, how did music bring you guys together? Well, <laughs> so yeah, we, we met at a gig where, where actually Raphael was hired to do the sound on that particular occasion, mm. right? Mm. And uh, and I was um, booked as a singer, and uh, it was, wasn't it that you uh, you had to buy, you didn't actually have the equipment you needed for that gig, and you had to buy a piece of equipment, right? Yeah, it was... Um... <clears throat> It was my second year in music uni, actually, and uh, and I had this guitar. It's a long story, and it's not it's not relevant to go into that. But anyway, I had a guitar that I wanted to get rid of, and suddenly somebody asked me, "Can you do the sound for this uh, event?" And I didn't have I, I didn't have the gear, but I sold that guitar just to buy everything that I needed to do the, to do the gig. Yeah, and that's you know. That's so why I, so I said I said yes to that, and I went there and I did the sound, and that's how we met. Yeah, yeah, and then it was um. In the middle of the um, of the evening, they asked him to play a song, and I hadn't actually sang on my own yet at that point. Like I was just joining in, and my my set was much later. And um, and then when they asked Raphael to play a song, I just was immediately captivated by it. just the intro of the song was so beautiful, actually. And um, yeah, I was like, wow, like who's he? And uh, and I heard a voice actually above my head saying, there he is. It was like a kind of clear audience experience. It's a kind of experience I don't have very often, but I have had a few times in my life. Mm. And I was like, what? There who is? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And then I just found myself singing with him. And it was, a, it was a really unique experience because I didn't know the song. And although the song is fairly repetitive, it was like the, the melody was being revealed to me before I'd even heard it. It was a really mm. strange moment, like kind of auspicious moment in my life. And uh, I was thinking, God, I hope he doesn't mind that I'm just hijacking his song and joining in with him without <laughs> even knowing him. And I was looking at him thinking, I really hope he looks up from his guitar and just like acknowledges me and lets me know this is okay because um, it's a little bit intrusive potentially. And, um, and then he looked up and he just nodded like that and I was like, okay, cool. So I just kept singing. <laughs> and then in the end, like, it was interesting. Everyone was sitting down. We were both standing up. Or were, you, were you sitting down and I was standing up? I was standing up. You were standing up too. So we were both standing up. And then um, 
when I sat down, everyone's like, wow, I had no idea you knew him. Like, that was really beautiful. I was like, I, I don't know him. Like, well, how did you know the song? I was like, I don't, I don't know the song. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was really amazing and magical, totally magical. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of our, of our meeting. And yeah. at the end of the night, um, I said to him, oh, yeah, we were chatting. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do an album. And he said, I'd like to play on your album. I was like, you're going to be on everything. <laughs> So you were, you guys were meant to come together, right? <laughs> Very much so. It was just like written in the stars and the universe and everything is yeah, you're aligning mm -hmm. you guys together. So, do, are you guys? Uh, do you do you come from a spiritual background? I mean, you can both answer this individually. Um, mm -hmm. You both come from a spiritual background. Okay. Shall I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, do I come from a spiritual background? That's um, so I come from a Catholic. I would say family, but that would be inaccurate for my Catholic mom <laughs> because my dad couldn't care any less. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and pretty much none of us, like we were, we're five siblings, pretty much none of us really embraced Catholicism, Christianity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we all <clears throat> kind of stepped out of it pretty as soon as we could really, I mean, I guess. I probably was the last one that my mom was taking to the church because <laughs> I was the youngest one. But at some point I was like, mom, I really don't feel like coming. <laughs> and then, and then I think the, you know, many years later, I came back to uh, spiritual concepts, uh, mostly through psychology, actually, funnily enough. Um, I, I, at some point I started reading quite a bit of Carl Jung. And, uh, and and Jungian and Jungian analysts as well, and, and you know, and different people, and then I started coming into contact with you know, kind of modern spirituality, and you know, uh, and people who were interested in in Indian philosophy and uh, and and Reiki and chakras and these and that. Um, so, but I didn't I didn't kind of like fully go into it. It was kind of like a you know something that I I, I was in contact with and. Uh, and curious about, but uh, but uh, but I think what happened is that my my musical expression, because I, I was a musician already, I, I started playing guitar in '93, and I started with rock bands and rock blues and this and that, and then kind of when I when I left the bands that I was with in the '90s, then I started going into a more introspective acoustic kind of direction, and naturally my my the way I started writing lyrics naturally started being much more existential and much more you know, for, for a few years before I came to any kind of spiritual practice, I was already writing a certain way, you know. Mm. And then, and then I think the, 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 the moment that, you know, one, one crossroads in my life was when I went to India on my own in 2005. And I actually sat for 10 days in a Vipassana retreat. Okay. And that, that was kind of like, you know, a big opening for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, yeah, background, probably my back, my spiritual background is, is more religious than spiritual and I, and I rejected it. Mm -hmm. And then gradually I started, you know, connected with certain aspects of certain things, but I don't, I don't feel like I follow any specific path or, uh, and I identify with that which resonates with me, you know, and I'm, I'm mostly into, into Buddhism and meditation, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about you, Lucidia? And mantra singing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I grew up with, in a very alternative, I guess you could say, household. Like, my um, my dad was, like, as as much of a hippie you could possibly imagine from the 60s. <laughs> like, literally the epitome of the 60s hippie. Mm -hmm. And all of his um, experimentation and exploration that... Um, was made some great story time when I was a child <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we grew up in the middle of the countryside and then um, my mum was um, like really into Buddhism and she was also a Quaker mm. like she used to attend the Quaker meetings also we used to go to the monastery Buddhist, Buddhist monastery at weekends and uh, my parents would meditate and we had to help the monks in the kitchen oh, and do our like dharma mm. dharma practice <laughs> like as in like the the doing i can't really call it now the 
dharmic yoga you know when you, when you karma yoga karma yoga that's karma what I'm talking yoga. about and um <laughs> yeah which we were a little bit disgruntled about but then we really enjoyed it because the monks were very funny and we, we had a lot of fun with them and yeah. um, playing hide and seek in the pantry and stuff. <laughs> 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 after we'd help them with their chores <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And then uh, yeah, we used to go to Krishnamurti talks a lot. And, and I used to go to the nursery. And uh, I remember that distinctly. We used to go to Rockwood Park where he used to give his talks. And I remember distinctly because at the end of the talks, the, the kids would come back in from the creche, like where I'd be doing pottery. And it was a really well-organized creche. And um, I remember that he took me and I sat on his lap. And my dad being so excited, he's like, you sat on Krishnamurti. <laughs> Well, that old man. <laughs> <Come back here>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so funny. <laughs> so yeah, so we had a lot of, um, you know, it wasn't all like um, perfect, my childhood at all. Like uh, my parents were lacking in harmony, to say the least. And there's all kinds of things I could say and, and probably won't on a, on a public forum. But, you know, we got through it. And um, my parents separated when I was about 11. My dad moved to America. And eventually, I also ended up in America, and then I um, basically, I moved to LA for a while and had a really burned myself out kind of with mm. just a lot of negative people. And then I moved to live with um, my Buddhist priest friend, my Zen Buddhist priest friend, Shinto priest, who is both Buddhist Zen and Shinto, in a Zen monastery in California, the Temple of Compassionate Light, Jikoji. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I had an amazing time living there. It was it was funny because I basically lived there based on my connection with that with the head priest there, um, Ruho Yamada. And um, but um, as a, a prerequisite to living there, I had to do zazen every morning, and I didn't even know what zazen was at that point. I hadn't ever done any Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. and so I had to like get up super early. I think it was four forty five, um, and do the zazen practice. And uh, and I started to experience a lot of um, deep realizations during that practice. So it was all very unexpected. Mm. And then, of course, living in the aura, I was sharing a room with the um, head priest because it was there were no rooms available at the temple. So to have me living there, he said, "Well, I'll share my room with her." Mm -hmm. So we had two little single beds in the room, and um, I was sleeping in the aura of a very realized person, I guess. And that was a, an incredible experience. And he gave me a lot of healing and, and got me through a lot of trauma that I had in my, in my life, actually. I'd had a lot of crazy experiences and a lot of very lost experiences and a lot of um, assault in different ways. And, and it was amazing to, to have the focus of someone like that. And it was, he really lifted my boat out to sea. You know, it was um, an incredible blessing an absolutely incredible blessing yeah. what is yeah. this uh is it zazen zazen yeah practice? zazen it's like what zen, it? zen meditation it's like it's just sitting practice basically it's, it's right. very um methodical yeah. it's always done the same way same posture your hand goes like in a certain way and your hands rest in a certain position and it's basically a very very simple simple meditation practice mm -hmm. but um but it was very profound for me and uh, yeah, you, I understood the value of it. Do you like stay in the one position for hours, or I know no, no, only like I think it was only like forty-five minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it was like for me that was still quite a big thing. Right? <laughs> but they but they did have a lot of practices at the temple, like where you did ten days silent meditation and stuff. But I was young and I was rebellious, and I always right. found my way to kind of not do things actually correctly and i was probably like a bit of a problem child for all of them but, yeah yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's like you know when you think about monks and um you think oh they're gonna be up in the mountain meditating all day but then when you mention oh no they're playing joke and never say what yeah yeah <laughs> you know there's we have like a perspective on on the spiritual teachers and the monks and we think that they just meditate all day and they're holy all day but it's not the case isn't it uh, you know yeah no, i mean Bruja was the most fun monk I could ever imagine spending time with he was just an absolute blast like I, I don't think I've ever had so much fun with anyone <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, he was absolutely phenomenally brilliant and everyone that met him agreed he was great to go out dancing with he used to come to clubs with me and everything oh wow, really <laughs> monk going to clubs he, he, 
<laughs> he was blind and, and he would come and he would come just to protect me because I was like, oh, Ruho, it's so annoying. All these guys, they were just let me dance. He's like, yeah. I'll come and protect you. So he would just come and meditate. Mm. And then if anyone came to, because I'd be like, Ruho, dance with me. And he'd get up and he'd just dance and he'd go wild so no one could come near me. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. And then we bump a... into people that were like, oh my God, I was in your temple 30 years ago. You taught me shiatsu. You taught me meditation. And I was like, wow, you've made an impact on a lot of people in your life. That's amazing. Um, so, Lucidia, I know um, your grandfather was a poet. And uh, yeah. your great grandfather was an Italian opera singer. So yeah, you come from this, side. yeah, you come from this artistic creative background. So yeah. do you feel the music was always in you? Definitely. And, and my dad, like, my dad was always playing music around me. My dad's a musician as well, and he writes beautiful songs. And um, so, yeah, that was the most glorious part of my childhood, I think, because just there was music. My mum loved to sing as well. So there was a lot of music. And my dad was in a band and they used to rehearse in my house. And mm. um, so it was just always, always about music. And, and I was always in it and into it. And I started writing poetry when I was about four. And my, my granddad would help me. I'd go take them to my granddad and he'd say, like, no, that's not how you do it. You have to rhyme A with P. It has to be A, B, A, B, or A, B, A, C. You know, he would tell me all the rhyming patterns and make sure it was very traditional in English, and which I, I think in some ways stunted my creativity a bit because I had a real free, free flow about my writing. But at the same time, it was so nice to be encouraged. And I just loved that time with my granddad, you know, where I'd sit with him in his room and and we'd sit there and look at my work together and then he would mm -hmm. show me his poems and explain why you know where i should work towards and <laughs> how and yeah it was a very special special yes. thing i'm so lucky to have had such wonderful teachers in my life my granddad was just incredible in all levels he grew food everywhere like he had five allotments and he grew food randomly all over the town where he lived wow. and he would go back every day on his walk and take water and water all his things on his plants <laughs> so he, he was just an amazing that's, that's a cool thing he was oh. so cool <laughs> oh, that's amazing um what about you Raphael? are you from a musical background um, uh, uh when did no, you discover you I'm absolutely not uh, I, in recent years i found out that one of my great granddads because both my mom and my dad come from this small village in central spain uh, one of my great granddads did uh, <clears throat> did play a wind instrument. Of, he played a horn in the in the in the town's band as an amateur, as an adult. So I, I found that I found this out just only a few a few years ago. But before that, it, there's no one in my family that is a musician. Mm. My uncle, my mum's brother, does have an amazing voice. Mm. And he sings kind of quite operatic mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> styles. Um, but, you know, no, no one who actually pursued an actual career in music. What there was a lot of was music in, in, my, you know, in, my, in my house when I was growing up. I had, um, you know, because I said I'm, I'm the youngest of five. So my older siblings, they, they were always playing, you know, mostly rock music, rock and pop music. Uh, so I was listening to a lot of like Spanish rock as well as, you know, American and British like highlights, let's say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I really like what, what I do remember is that as a young child, I, I had a lot, I loved music. And I, and I really, you know, I remember knowing lyrics to songs I didn't quite understand, mm -hmm. but I knew the lyrics to them because, mm -hmm. you know, I played them on repeat and, that, and it was kind of, so <clears throat> in my awareness, there was a lot of, uh, you know, that was kind of my school, you know. And what happened is when I was around 15, <clears throat> I was, um, <coughs> excuse me, yes. um, I joined this Boy Scouts group when I was 13 and a bit. Well, my, my brother and my sister, my next two siblings, were already part of. And then when I was there, like, there was a lot of people who strummed a couple of chords on the guitar. So, mm -hmm. because there was, you know, there was, you know, there was a big culture of just playing, playing guitars and, you know, when you were camping and stuff. And, um, yeah, and a couple of years after I joined, I was like, doesn't look so hard, you know, I see all these people just strumming a couple of chords, it doesn't look so hard. So I, I decided to give it a go. And like I said, there was so much music in my mind and, uh, and I was, you know, I guess at school when, you know, when, when we had to learn music and play the recorder and stuff, like there was, there was always me and another guy that always got the, 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 the firsts on everything. 
because we had that natural musicality, whereas, you know, people who are really good at other areas, they really struggle with music. But anyway, when, as, as soon as I picked up a guitar, there was no looking back, basically. It was just mm. like, I really had a strong feeling about it and, and it felt like this is my path. This is my yeah. path. And that's it was it. your soul calling. So, it? yeah, not so much a background, but, uh, but you know, but, uh, but I did have a really good, like, schooling in terms of music mm. and, and, you know, and a variety of, of styles and people and 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 i had it all in my consciousness mm -hmm. by the time i picked up the guitar there was a lot there already so um now lucidia oh my god i know you play the harp and uh, you know you're you're absolutely amazing at it by the way because um when i met you at the conscious dinner club and you yeah. completely like blew me away i was like oh my god she's so amazing <laughs> <laughs> so like how did that come about like you playing the harp well, that was um, that was funny actually because I never really was like I mean I did play a few I dabbled with instruments like, when I was younger but I never really it was all about singing for me more than anything else so I I did get quite into the violin at one point but um, I gave everything up you know as I got older and um, and then when I was in Hawaii when I was younger um, I saw a couple playing the harp together mm. and so they were on one each of them playing one harp. And it was just so beautiful and so romantic. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe when I'm an old lady, like, I can't imagine ever getting into knitting or crochet. Maybe I'll play harp in my rocking chair. That's such <laughs> a beautiful thing to do. And for some reason, that was what I thought. Like, oh, it would really? be that then. Maybe I didn't imagine myself sitting down to actually study anything until that mm -hmm. point or something. But then I went to, I was living in Brighton when I came back to England. And, um, and, uh, yeah, it was right before I got pregnant with my second child, and um, and I went to have some singing lessons. I think I, I didn't know I was pregnant yet, for sure, and um, I went to have some singing lessons, and I just signed up with this, this one, there was only one guy that I could find in the local newspaper offering singing lessons, and I didn't enjoy his singing lessons at all. Like, he just did not teach me in a way that I felt was really going to benefit me. But I paid for 10 lessons up front and I was like, oh no, and I knew he wouldn't give the money back, I could feel it. Mm. And so I just said, is there anything else you teach other than singing? And he said, well, yeah, I teach harp. Oh, no. I was like, harp, really? That's interesting. I thought I'd quite like to play the harp. Well, can we switch the money and I can learn harp with you instead? And he was like, yeah, okay. So that was it. And that was amazing because then when I started playing, I was just like, oh, I'm so glad I didn't wait till I was old to play. This is actually quite a big thing. Like I need like a lot of years of practice to be able to enjoy playing when I'm an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of what happened. And, um, and then it was amazing because, bless you, <laughs> because, um, yeah, like he had this harp and then he was going to sell it to me. And then he changed his mind at the last minute. Mm. And I was really disappointed. And he was like, no, I'm going to keep it, actually. And then he, he said, well, maybe the guy that made it for me can make you one. Mm. So that connected me with my really wonderful teacher who I went to, who I um, paid him to, what do you call him, commissioned him to make me a harp. Mm. And that was my first harp, Gloria, who's actually on loan to my friend right now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so um, I yeah. got that harp finally. But I basically had to wait because I, then I realized I was pregnant and then I knew I didn't have the money for it right then. So I had to, but he said he'd wait basically and he took payments and yeah. finally I got my first half. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, okay. So Raphael, mm -hmm. I'm aware that you performed at the Roundhouse, the Royal Festival Hall, right? So yeah. very briefly, what was that experience like for you? So that was that was basically uh, I was in Goldsmiths College in South London in in Kings uh, sorry Kings Cross no, New Cross, mm -hmm. and uh, I was studying psychology at the time, but I was connected to a lot of people in the music degree because uh, I was doing some uh, foundation courses and I'm you know I connected with some people, and uh, so there was this um, this choir that run by this singer Esca, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's that's how I ended up performing there. It was great. It was it was a great experience. It was fun. It was loads of fun because it was a lot of us, and and uh, it was a very dynamic performance. And you know, it's nice to be part of a big thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly the Royal Festival Hall was also. It wasn't just a hundred of us singing. There was also like a, a big band on stage, mm -hmm. and uh, and the whole thing was coordinated by this electronic. Uh, music producer and big band arranger 
called Matthew Herbert. And uh, he had just released an album where Eska was the main performer. So, uh, so they basically got someone from the Laban Center to, to not, so we weren't, we weren't only singing, we, we had all this choreography going on. Mm-hmm. So there was this guy from the Laban Center that came to all our rehearsals to make the whole choreography for each one of the songs that we were singing at. So uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was about 15 years ago and uh, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was good. It was a yeah. nice experience. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So like, now we know like a bit about your background. Amazing background, by the way. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Shinari. Uh, so oh. this amazing collaboration between the two of you, man. Um, how did that come about? I guess since we we met in that um, in yeah. that first event, then after that, well, Sh- we Sh- started. Sh- 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 Nari to... comes from before. Yeah, Sh- Nari is actually the, the name um, when. Ruho, the Zen Shinto priest I lived with at the temple, he he got very ill with cancer and died. Oh. And um, before he died, um, I'm, I'm not sad about it at all, which is a really funny thing, but he really prepared me very well um, for the transformation and I never felt him gone. So I didn't have to grieve his loss. So um, yeah, that's why I'm not looking sad when I say <laughs> that. But um, yeah, basically, um, at that before he died a few days before he died i said look i know this is a really selfish thing to trouble you with right before you die and you're on your deathbed but i really want you to choose the name for my music project mm. and he was like he said are you silly that is my cosmic play <laughs> he said <laughs> and he was delighted to be asked so he spent three days meditating on what should be the name for the music project and he came up with the name Srinari. so it was a, it was a name that i i held for a while i I met the father of my kids. I, I had met, just met him before, and then we, we had that name together for our music. And then um, I met Raphael, and um, we, me and the father of my children parted ways in that way, and, and then we took on the name together, and Srinari, because that name kind of had to go with me, because that was, um, that was the name given to me by, mm. by Ruho for my music. Mm. So uh, and then we started working together like sh- straight away after we met basically we just mm. started working Raphael at the time he was living in Brixton and we were up on his roof like working out harmonies and mm-hmm. practicing and making songs together and working on songs that we'd written and integrating each other into our songs and, mm. and we just never looked back we've <laughs> been busy at it ever since we met like over <laughs> 10 years ago now yeah. we what literally does, have to stop. What does Shinari mean then? Do you, do you... So basically he told me he did tell me what it why he chose that name but he also told me never to tell anybody Okay, okay. Well, so uh, <laughs> But it does, it's it does a top have secret. The, 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 <laughs> there are some. It, it, it does have a Sanskrit name. It does have Sanskrit. Yes, yeah, someone. That's, that's public. You know, that's. Yeah. Just, okay. Apparently, yeah. in Sanskrit, someone came up to me once after a gig, and they said, "In Sanskrit, it means holy woman." Ah. So beautiful. I thought that was really beautiful. I don't know if uh, Ruho was aware of that when he chose the name or not, hmm. but that, that was really nice to hear that it had that <laughs> that meaning. And Ruho really revered me a lot. He called me Dragon Lady. Mm. He felt that I was like a dragon, mm. and uh, which is very important to Shinto mythology. So, mm. Um, mm. so the fact I, he he was really into Sanskrit, actually. Funny enough, being a Japanese and Shinto priest, but it's quite possible that he understood that, that he knew that. that, he yeah. knew that. Mm. Okay, so um, what was uh, your journey in creating the kind of music um, that you do? Like, what is the message behind your music? I mean, well, I, I mean, I've always been very, very clear that I'm here to write, like, for the earth, um, in a way, like, environmental um, consciousness is really important to me, mm. and I've always been um, feeling that that's a deep inner campaign of mine, is to try to protect the environment as much as possible, and to try and bring awareness to issues related to the environment. So that's, like, one really important thing, and to me, that's, like, you know, spirituality in action, like the most profound and important spirituality of our times, you know, to really protect the planet and, and to really try to line up our philosophies and morals with what we do in each moment, which is what I try to do. And it's hard because it's impossible to move without any impact around the, this planet or even just around, you know, 
London, you know, it's like it's hard to be in integrity. So I don't manage it on every level and I had to let go of being impeccable because it's it just caused me too much stress and I didn't find a, a way. <laughs> um, but I do try to teach my children as much as possible and I try to also be in alignment with my values as much as I possibly can and, and, and delivering a message about that is a massive and very integral to what, what I naturally speak about. Um, and then also like there's a channeled element to my writing that really started coming through massively after um, spending the time with Ruho in the Zen temple after that period of Zaza and meditation my writing changed and it became a lot more um, transcendental hmm. much more beyond me and um, yeah one of the, the I think the poem that was the kind of moment of transformation where my writing began to change we were thinking about sharing that poem with you at the end of this podcast because that's when um that was when my writing became more transcendental and, and it's actually called transcendence <laughs> <laughs> um, and we put it to music together and um but yeah like channeling is is something that i've been lucky enough to experience you know i don't see myself as um in any way um superior to anybody or inferior and I've been working hard at not feeling inferior because you know it's easy to have insecurities and I'm definitely not beyond them but um working with just just feeling the gratitude really of, of like when when it comes as a blessing and a waterfall of words comes through me and just making sure I catch them hmm. and then share them with people and just be grateful that somehow I was chosen to deliver that th those particular words so that's like my favorite favorite thing in the world really and Mm. that's kind of what mm. I live for like those moments as well as my children mm. who are like yeah. my greatest um, pieces of art the way I see yeah. it um, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's really beautiful I mean because your your music kind of it's it's there to uplift the world isn't it so I think it's really really beautiful now I'm I've seen quite a few artists are uh, trying to make it in America um there's there seems to be a theme happening here um, did you ever go down that route, um, going to America, trying to make it there? Yeah, I, I was there in LA for a while, like, but before I moved up to the temple, and um, yeah, it was a, it was a really yucky, yucky world. <laughs> really, I can't think of better way to yes. say it. I think a lot, a lot of artists can relate. Toxicity, a lot of toxicity, and a lot of um, taking advantage of each other mentality there was a lot of uh, people using each other and trying to use me and a lot of sexual um um what do you call it lack of integrity lack of sexual integrity from people that were offering opportunities and not just to me to a lot of people i could see so much ugliness but um, it's, it's all happens in london as well it's not like it's not like it doesn't happen here yeah. but it, i did find it was people call la the belly of the beast some people and as much as it's got so much beauty and so much lovely nature and some amazing people i'm definitely not saying la is all bad i have to say that my experience there was quite negative because it was hard to know who to trust and in the end um you know, I, I felt like my conclusion was just there wasn't anyone there that I could trust. <laughs> but it's not that I've never met good people from LA, because I have. I've met some really special people, um, some of them since I left LA. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, I think it makes you very vulnerable when you're a young woman in a city where you don't have anyone around to look after you. And, you know, everybody knows that you're far away from your family. It's kind of like it makes you kind of a prime target for mm. manipulation so yeah and i guess yeah. like um so if you're highly investing. sorry uh, it was enlightening yeah. <laughs> in a way. so I, I guess like um uh if you're um highly sensitive soul then you would struggle quite a lot um in 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 media um unless you don't work through your own issues um so what would you say to the girls or even men who who are in the same position and um uh, what would you say to them how would you sort of like i would say to like really listen and be so true to yourself because um it's so easy to get swept especially when people start dangling you know carrots in front of you like oh i can give you this and i can give you that and sometimes people 
they work you out before you've even opened your mouth. They know what you want to hear just by looking at you, the way you dress, the way you present yourself, or they hear you talking to someone else and they already know what you want to hear and what will, what you'll find convincing. So mm. I think it's really important to really listen to, to your intuition and to, if you have any doubt, get out really. Mm. Like, yeah. don't, don't stay in a situation for, for, for any amount of time that feels like it might be <clears throat> taking something from you or that's asking you to step outside of your comfort zone and take some space, reevaluate. And then if you feel that it's safe, come back to it, but don't, don't hang out where, um, where it seems like you might be pulled out of, out of your center, mm. you know, which is a good reminder for me even now, like it's, we're all learning all the time and being reminded constantly of what we've learned. And I'm so lucky now to have Raphael by my side and somebody that, you know, I'm so inspired by his art and his writing and his musicality and everything that he brings to me. And I also have him as a partner, so I have his protection yeah. right there. So that's a shield, you know, and um, I'm so blessed to have a shield. And I'd say to have people around that you can trust as much as possible, like, and not to just put yourself into crazy situations without anyone, you know, mm. and hope for the best, like make sure you've got a backup plan always. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's about <laughs> trusting the signs from the universe, right? <laughs> Listening <laughs> really intuition. Deeply, yeah. and, and logic as well. Like yeah. don't go to a random part of town where you don't know anybody, you know, just mm. being, you know, a little bit streetwise, which I wasn't at all. Like I got myself into so many difficult situations and I learned the hard way. But mm. I think people these days, young people are, are a little bit more aware in general. I think there's a lot more awareness out there and a lot more um, support, I, I hope. It seems like that. Yeah. I think my, my children anyway, you know, they're teenagers now and they're a lot more savvy than I was at their age. They just mm. seem to have this inbuilt kind of know-how and they, they kind of, just get what's up you know yeah. they're, they're naturally cool you know they're like yeah. they're yeah. much, much harder to um, mislead than I was I think yeah that's that's a great advice for uh, young kids out there who who are trying to make it um in America or even in uh, in UK in London, um, any, yeah I've had all kinds um, of experiences here too <laughs> yeah um now um now I'm in your mantra club, <laughs> and so every morning you sing mantras, and I think it's it's such an incredible thing you're doing because mantras, as you know, is qu they're quite powerful. Um, and I just want to know how uh, how did that come about? Like, uh, how did you? What was your reason behind mixing mantras to the mix of your music? <laughs> um. No? I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think mantra is a very, you know, because it's transpersonal. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I guess I, I I have tended to write in a quite transpersonal way anyway, when I when I write songs in recent years. But because it is transpersonal, it's much more relatable. And you know, as long as people are in the in the you know in the current of of, of that, and they understand why it is the way it is, then then it's a you know it's a very shareable experience, and it's mm. nice to it's nice it is nice to be able to offer that to people. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a I guess. I guess we have been part of uh, of the, the 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 yoga meditation scene for quite a few years now, and mantra is, is quite a feature in that in that yeah. in that environment. And people get it and understand what the power is of of uh, you know of emptying your mind and calling on these energies and using sound and and the power of your voice to, I mean, just just using your voice as a healing thing. Yeah. And then, and then when you tap into these current currents that are have been switched on for so long, with you know, with so many prayers put into them and so much energy already put into them, it over you already you know, even from a psychological perspective, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about me being interested in in Jung and 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 that 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 type of psychology, you're kind of tapping into the collective subconscious and. Hmm. And tapping into all these energies that you know that are pri primordial and that you know that are there, so it's um yeah I mean it's just just a, you know it's 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 part of it's part of our spiritual practice and it's hmm. a it's a great thing to to offer to people. So 
because we are artists and we write songs and we have done for so long. That's our natural expression. Mm. Uh, it's very easy to get into the mantra aspect of things, mm. but it's very easy to combine them too. So, uh, oh. so what we do, what we do is is we create our own music for the mantras, mm -hmm. which I guess perhaps to some people maybe not the way you should do it. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. We don't really know much what's what's uh yeah. So um respected or not yeah. respected. But but we have, we hope know. we're not disrespecting anybody. So to me the most important thing is that it feels right, you know, and yeah. uh and essentially people started asking us to sing mantra. <clears throat> That's what happened mm. and we, we, we play a lot for a uh, a woman who's half um, Hindu and um, comes from a half, her father is Hindu. So she started asking us to sing mantra. Other people started asking us to sing mantra. And at first I was actually like, why is everyone asking me to sing mantra? Like, mm. I, I didn't really understand it. I thought there's plenty of people doing mm. it. Like, why should I be another one? Mm -hmm. And then what happened was um, she had asked us in one of her events to sing a mantra to Shiva. And I had a very um, shamanic experience where I felt, as I was singing, I felt Shiva. That I didn't even know what Shiva exactly felt like before that, but I felt the energy of Shiva coming and coiling through my crown chakra, mm. through my head, mm. into my body and taking me over. And I just, it was a completely profound experience and I didn't expect it. And then I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. there's something to this hmm. and then it, it, it started to happen with different deities as, as that we would pray to that um, we would sing to them and they would reveal themselves to me hmm. shamanically in that way through my energy body coming into me and sh hmm. presenting themselves to me and that was why I got into <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, I think it's good that we sing mantra now because <laughs> this is really cool and very cosmic and I enjoy yeah. and I enjoy um, supernatural experiences yeah. and I always have. So when I started to see evidence that what we were doing actually had a tangible power mm. that was beneficial in my life, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And everyone's into it. Everyone asks us to sing it. Yeah. Everyone joins in. There's not like our songs, which can be quite intricate. And then there's a lot of group singing, which takes place, which is very beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. And it takes us to another place and it, it's more inclusive. It involves our audience more. Mm -hmm. And it's ultimately just a, a very profound and viable way to connect to the sacred and just to say the holy name which um which is what i understand is kind of the essence of kirtan so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that is beautiful i mean i love your mantra <laughs> <laughs> it's there every day we really, really so, enjoy uh, yeah. music, the mantra yeah. and then just like you know learning as we go we're still learning we're definitely not experts yeah. and then and it's I mean, nice just to be humble in that and be present for the journey of um, exploration as yeah, well, yeah. sharing that with others. Yeah, yeah, you're not meant to know. I mean, you know, like you say, like the universe will align you with what you need to do now and then align you with something else. So you have to be open to everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm aware that you work with cacao, right? So can you explain okay. it to the listeners who have no idea what this is and what are the okay. benefits of it? So cacao is basically like the pure essence of chocolate, which is when it's untreated, basically unroasted, nothing's added to it. It's like the um, the cacao is a, is, is a plant, it's a bean, mm -hmm. and um, it has like over 300 naturally occurring um, chemical alkaloids, which are really beneficial to the health. And then what happens when people make things into make make that into chocolate? They they change the temperature, they add cheap oils, they add often dairy, lots of sugar, and then it becomes junk food. But before, <laughs> before that happens, it's actually a, an incredibly powerful and mm. healing medicine. Mm. Um, it's not for everyone. There are contraindications. So I always, I'm very responsible. So if I'm going to talk about something, I always have to speak about the contraindications, like for people with, um, like if they're on certain medications, especially like certain antidepressant medications, if they have heart problems, blood pressure issues, it might not be the right medicine. So it's always worth checking with your physician <laughs> how to be uh, sensible here. And you can read about it online in great detail. Um, but basically for, the, for most people, it's an incredibly beneficial medicine, which literally assists you in opening your heart it releases like molecules it release in the brain and it, it opens the heart makes you feel a sense of euphoria and a sense of connectedness to everything and 
also gives you a massive energy boost and um, helps you also to connect to nature, being a plant spirit, a plant deity. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, for me, taking cacao, having <clears throat> this pure ceremonial grade cacao, chocolate, um, and then being outside in nature, making music, going for beautiful walks, like mm -hmm. it's all very synergistic with the cacao, mm -hmm. with the cacao plant. <laughs> and um, so we love to combine that as a ceremony, as a lot of people are doing, like mm -hmm. we're definitely not the first. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people doing cacao ceremonies where they make a beverage out of the cacao and do meditations and healings and different kinds of journeys. And mm -hmm. we obviously combine our music within that mm -hmm. ceremonial space and we work with a really beautiful yin yoga teacher, Sandy Sharkey, um, who uh, works in London where we work. And um, mm -hmm. so we make a ceremony with her. We do yin yoga, we do sound healing, mm -hmm. we do um, group singing. We also play some of our music and then we do an ecstatic dance as well. And it's, um, it's a beautiful experience. Yeah. And uh, we're very honored to be able to host those works and to hold the um, the uh, container for people to experience that medicine mm -hmm. and, and to enjoy our music with that enhancement. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a great combination there, a cacao and your music, you are saying like, it's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought, I was like, this is great, we get to like be in this music, we get to drink cacao, <laughs> we get to feel like so much bliss, even more than normal, this is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. well, that's amazing. So, um, what are your plans for the future? I mean, what's next for Shinari? So Shree Nari. Well, one thing is we want to grow our mantra club. We're doing we, it every yeah. morning at 10 a.m. Yeah. until 10.30. And we're doing it on Zoom. Although on Monday, we do it on our Facebook, Shree Nari, which is S-H-R-I-N-A-R-I. -R -I. And on, on Instagram as well. On Mondays, we do it on all platforms. Mm. And then the rest of the time, every morning, every single day, it's from 10 till 10.30 on Zoom. And that's just really a lovely thing as we get to meet with a group of people mm -hmm. that take part in that club and, and sing with us every morning as a spiritual practice. So it's a way of us committing to our mantra to practice and everyone else committing to their practice with us, which mm -hmm. is a real beautiful thing to do. Yeah. It's a service. It's, it's a, a service. service. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as in what's next uh, for us, um, yeah, we, we're not, comp we don't have like a very structured plan as to how things are going to develop. I mean, th yeah, things, more, things more are more happening different. right now. I'm working on a, on a remix of one of our, of our songs for a mm -hmm. compilation for this charity, tree planting charity that's mm -hmm. based, in, uh, based in Portugal, what works mostly in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So that's that's gonna that's gonna happen in the next couple of weeks. We're gonna we're gonna put out a track with them, and other than that, it's just um, I guess I guess it's just just you know just keep doing what we're doing and growing our following and uh, and and I think we we're doing everything very grassroots. Like we don't I don't envision us having like a record deal or anything like that. What I envision us having is a is a really strong following of people who know us and love us mm. and and who you know very from the ground up but that's that's how i see it because it's the nature of what we do and it's yeah, kind of we're like not, we're not pop we're not yeah, pop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we kind so, of have to go grow things in an organic yeah. way yeah yeah and and then, that's the best way to do yeah yeah i mean i personally have a mixed feeling about uh, about the whole traveling like because we know some people who in even at an alternative level they travel the world constantly because you know they go do an event here and event there. I have I have mixed feelings about that because I feel I feel like the whole the whole carbon footprint is kind of like almost against my ethos. I mm -hmm. personally feel like because you know like I, the, the way the way I feel about this and it's funny that this whole lockdown has brought has made us have to do Facebook lives so regularly mm -hmm. because all our concerts were cancelled and then suddenly we were in this situation where you know the way for us to get our music out there was just to do facebook lives and uh, i actually love it i actually love the fact that that you can be in your living room yeah and you can you can have this really healthy lifestyle where you're literally just going out for walks in nature mm. you're coming back home you're doing your work and and then you connect with people from anywhere in the world mm. yeah you know and like just having people in australia and new zealand and people in the states and people in south america 
people in Europe just all connect and, and be able to enjoy your music like that. Yeah. And I understand that obviously, I pre- I, if I'm going to watch music, I always prefer to see the people face to face. Yeah. But at the same time, the, the idea that you can listen to any artist from anywhere in the world, mm-hmm. yeah, just from your living room, and that the sound quality is so good, yeah. actually. Yeah, you know, it is. Yeah, most of the time. a lot of people are uh, going it's, online it's, nowadays, aren't they? So, yeah, um, right. Yeah. So now yeah, I have I some. I love being with people. There. I mean, I've, I do. I've, I do love yeah. being with people. What I'm <laughs> saying, what I'm saying is, 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 as, as our following grows, because that's how what I expect to happen. Because Lucidia just finished a university degree, and and our oh, life. Congratulations, been, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> and and our life somehow have been such that we couldn't really fully focus on our music as much as that we did, you know, we we we've been quite focused right. and we put a lot of energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we haven't been able to make the music a hundred percent of our focus because we had too many other things in our mm-hmm. plate. Mm-hmm. It really feels like right now is the moment where we're really gonna put that 100%. level of 100% yeah. Yeah. because the kids are bigger mm. and and because you know we've we've climbed a certain number of mountains you yeah. know like yeah. and we're at a place right now where this is it this is it now we're just going to focus gonna and we're going to carry on playing it out, out and there. i guess we don't really know where that's going to take us is the truth mm. like we, we, we don't, pray yeah, we, we, have we no hope clue. and we aim mm. you know ultimately it's about spreading our music as, as far and as wide mm. as possible and that's always been my vision just like just wanting to potentialize the gift that's given mm. because this is the gift that we've been given this is where we're guided to go and what we're guided to sh- to share mm. and so just hoping that it reaches as many people as possible to potentialize mm-hmm. what comes through yeah. us and what we're dedicating our time to and our efforts to. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Like going back to just trust the timing of everything. Um, mm. So I have a couple of uh, rapid fire questions for you before we uh-huh. head off. We're, I mean, we're, we're short on time. Um, so um, now, I, no, okay. Are you guys ready? So what? Um, uh-huh. You gotta answer this really yeah. quickly. Yeah, really quickly. Um, so what we'll do is Lucidia answers first and then Raphael, um, and then we can go into, yeah. Okay, right. ready? Ready. <laughs> okay, so what is your definition of God? Wow, God to me is vast. I couldn't possibly put God into a word because who knows? But um, I remember once having a meditation where I rested in God's lap and I could feel that the eternal nature of God spanning out in all directions. And for me, it's that vast, endless, boundless, all giving, all permeating consciousness that is just beyond form. And I'm so grateful to have it inside of me. Oh, beautiful. What about you? (laughs) (laughs) It's really beautiful. (laughs) What about you, Raphael? Um, Undefinable. Beautiful. And unnecessary to define mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. existence itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So very quickly, um, how do you define religion and spirituality? Religion, for me, um, speaks about the, the um, kind of set way of um, viewing things that um, certain groups of people have across the planet, which... I respect deeply, I have no idea who's wrong or right about anything, but um, what I do feel is that spirituality is something with less um, boundaries, less definition, and something which feels more like an organic realization from within mm-hmm. to me. However, I'm always open to be being proven wrong by anyone <laughs> who wants to take it on, I don't know. <laughs> with all respect to everyone, religious or spiritual or otherwise. <laughs> Okay, what about you? So, religion, the word itself, the etymological meaning of it is reconnection. Mm -hmm. So, the reason why they use that word is because it was supposed to be a reconnection to yourself. Now, when it comes to what we understand as religion, as organized religion, as many people have already pointed out in the past, it has diverged, you know, it has gone a different way and it has become more like a kind of control structure mm. than anything else and uh, and often op- more often than not connected to political powers um spirituality i think it's a very open and wide term that 
encompasses pretty much anything you want to put into it. But the one, the one common thread is the connection to the immaterial, to the spirit, mm. uh, which is that which isn't physical. And uh, so, yeah, I guess I guess that's probably easy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Very briefly, I know we all have big lessons. <laughs> In a like a really nutshell. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, I think I'm still still trying to learn very very basically. Like, I guess one thing which I struggle with is I trust way too easily, and I keep learning again and again. Yeah. That I shouldn't give my trust so easily and as much as I see the God in everybody um, the humanity is more complex than the divine being that is innate in every one of us mm. and that I need to understand um, and live with the awareness that it's better to hold myself with more containment mm. and not just give everything to everybody so willingly because I found that it just often causes in me getting hurt or um, mistreated hmm. and um, even and, and especially I could say sometimes in the spiritual community is you know it's, it's incredible it's been an incredible <laughs> <literally>. <laughs> so yeah that's I guess that's it and boundaries like it's all about boundaries and learning about hmm. boundaries is I'm I didn't really grow up knowing about boundaries my dad is an incredible man incredibly spiritually uplifting man and he's also kind of boundaryless in a way he's like a very big hmm. being and hmm. uh I think I just never learned that, so I'm I'm learning about that still. I'm I'm like a child. I never really um never really developed like into an adult in certain ways. So I'm just constantly learning, like with fresh eyes, you know, fresh perspective. Always at step one. <laughs> what about you, Raphael? So um, I mean, it'd be it'd be really hard to answer that question accurately and literally. But one lesson that I definitely haven't fully learned and and it's important, <laughs> mm -hmm. is that nothing that happens to you is personal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Right. perfect. Yeah. That's, that's Thank my God. Because <laughs> <That's laughs> <my list. laughs> that, 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 the, 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 the taking it personal, personally is the beginning of reacting. Yeah. And, yes. and that reacting is where you just give away your energy to anything, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think there's a lesson that everyone <laughs> wants to learn. <laughs> okay, so uh, one last one. Uh, do you believe there's an end to healing? No, mm. absolutely not. I, 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 I mean, even the Zen Shinto priest that I was lucky enough to live with, that a lot of people saw as a guru and a spiritual teacher, even he on the rare occasion showed me there was still something left to heal and mm. and I, I honestly I don't believe that like anyone I don't know I don't want to say I don't believe I have never met anyone 100% perfect or enlightened or flawless in this lifetime mm. even people that other people perceive to be so yeah. so mm. I personally just believe that as humans we're always going to have um, a little bit of uh, what's the world what's the word um when you are in duality, I think mm. when being a human being creates a certain duality, which I believe we transcend when we leave the body. Mm. If I meet someone uh, that's a hundred percent bona fide and enlightened, I will let you know. Mm. <laughs> Until then, that's my perspective. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> what about you, Raphael? So, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with Lucidia. Mm. Uh, I like. I, I, the way I see it is if 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 you're in the world you're kind of like you're in a process mm, mm. and it, 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 it being alive is 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 is, is being in a process and mm. that process always leads somewhere else and uh, you know uh, yeah I mean it's yeah I mean I guess again going back to the word healing if you're talking about a specific aspect of something that you could say that comes to a place where it's resolved and then that that specific healing mm. would have somehow concluded that to some extent mm -hmm. but as a, as a wider idea of healing i think healing is the process of leaving mm. so um, mm. yeah. living yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And and na nature want. is cyclical isn't it so yeah. it's like i think things run in cycles a lot yeah. mm. Like, mm. 
Absolutely agree with that. It's like a romantic idea to believe that <laughs> one could reach the plateau <laughs> and say, that's it, I made it. <laughs> and I, 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 I made that mistake many that's times it. when I was younger, <laughs> I'm not about to make it again. <laughs> So finally, what is the one message that you would like to share with someone who's going through adversity right now? Um, who, as someone who can't see the light um, at the end of, like, you know, they're in darkness and they can't see the light. What would you tell them right now? I, I would say, like, don't give up because even though you can't see how things will be around the corner, Thing that the path is full of twists and turns and there will be, you will turn a corner and if you make it past that corner by not giving up now, mm. I'm, I guarantee you that you'll be glad that you didn't give up back then, you know, when you were struggling because we just can't imagine how beautiful life can become. As much as troubles can come our way, we can't imagine the blessings that we are yet to experience and uh, there's been moments in my life where I really didn't want to be here anymore. And um, I'm so grateful I stuck around, you know. Yeah. I'm so, so grateful I stuck around to know the beauty of, of my life now, despite the fact that adversity still arises and struggles still come and people are still mean sometimes mm. and things are still difficult and sometimes even really difficult things happen. But mm. I'm so grateful to be here to live this experience. And um, one thing I learned is that life is an absolute gift it's an absolute treasure and we are mm -hmm. so blessed to have this experience of living so absolutely just, that is i hope so that you can beautiful. hold that in your heart and just just sit sit with that awareness that it's a gift and hold it tight to your heart while you ride through these waves until you make it through into the spaciousness again mm. so beautiful mm. really really beautiful um so how can people contact you so yeah. basically um they can either follow us on Instagram at Srinari Music or follow us on Facebook at Srinari. Mm -hmm. They can also email us if they go to srinari.com. There's a website there with a contact page. They can um, email our manager there um, if they want to book us for anything. Also, um, they can follow that page to our music on Bandcamp mm -hmm. and uh, they can follow us on Spotify at Srinari. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah right. through the website's a good one <laughs> yeah so guys go um follow them these guys are absolutely amazing now they're gonna sing us uh, a song um oh, so yeah. <laughs> more, more song whichever way <laughs> i was hoping you're gonna you're gonna play the harp <laughs> no, i'm not playing a harp in this one <laughs> Beyond mind, enveloped in spirit. Oh, oh. 
that was so beautiful thank you so so much uh guys for coming on this podcast and um yeah i absolutely love you guys i adore you i feel connected to you love your energy um and i wish you all the best and and i know for sure you guys are gonna be you guys are gonna make it (laughs) i know for sure um i have that inner knowing um yeah so thank you so much is there anything any last words you would like to say Mm. Thank you so much Thanks for so having, much us, for having here us here and for valuing what we do mm. and for being such a devoted uh, mm. enjoyer of our music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your number one fan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We, we All value, right. Thank you for everything we you really do. do. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye. Lots of love. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website, madhyasosan.com. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.